What's up, everybody? And welcome back to the Anything Better podcast with your host, me, Paul Verzi, my friend, Bill Burr, and Hello. our friend and producer out there in Beverly Hills, Andrew, the Greek freak, Themless. Boing, boing, boing. Sorry. Um, <laughs> guys, today you are listening to episode 71. Okay. And um, we got some 71 people. Bill, who do we got? Uh, the, okay, here we go. In the NFL, uh, the players in the Pro Football Hall of Fame wearing number 71, the great San Francisco 49er and San Diego Supercharger, Fred Dean. Uh, Larry Allen from the Purple People Eaters, Carl Eller, Walter Jones, George Connor, football star and TV star, rest his soul, Alex Karras. Uh, anybody else of honorable mention that I recognize uh, is Bill Pickle. Honorable mention, a guy named okay. Bill Pickle. And also, oh. what do you got? Gino Malkin from the Pittsburgh Penguins? Getty Malcolm of the Pittsburgh Penguins. Those are the number 71s. I'm not going into baseball or basketball because it's going to be somebody ridiculous. Yeah. And let's be honest. If you're a baseball or basketball player and you pick 71, that was a family number. It's not something or, – or you just made the team and that's what they had left in the box. <laughs> yeah. No, you, you <laughs> like eight like, up Dude, I got 71 for you. Um, all right. Well, I got to want uh, – I'm happy that we're back doing – Doing this and guys for the people that don't work during the nfl football season we're doing two anything betters a month instead of four because we give you the bet mgm stuff okay now bill i wanted to talk to you about something i called a buddy of mine i'll say his name uh i was home he's a neighbor of mine you know him you know him well the the our greek friend over there Giannis Papas. and i was going through i'm not gonna lie not bad not bad but i just had one with my wife i had one with my wife and uh you you weren't around and it was one of those where I pulled into stop and shop and I was waiting for them to deliver the groceries to the trunk. And I just fucking got into it. So I just needed a friend to just say, you know something? It's about their mood and it's about them. And he's listening. And then he goes like this. It was actually really funny. We talked about it with Bobby yesterday on his podcast briefly. But I wanted to emphasize this because me and you do this sometimes. And any man or woman listening to this, ladies, we know you call your girlfriends when you're having issues with your husband or boyfriend. Hey, Paul, guess what? I don't give a fuck what they do. Well, <laughs> Go ahead. We don't need to make them feel better. Just say what you did. All right. So this is what happens. I call him up. I tell him my bitch. And he goes, yeah, you know, uh, they, you know, they go through stuff, you know, and they got, he starts doing that. So I'm listening. At first I'm listening. He's like, you know, their bodies and hormones and stuff like that. And then as he's doing it, I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then I just go, and we both left. I go, oh, things are going, I go, things are going good. And he goes, yeah. And we just bursted the fuck out laughing because he was like in a good place because he went through the stretch. Okay. That's what a friend does is they let you fucking lay it on them and they're on board. On <laughs> fucking board, dude. You know, they're Absolutely. the one going. Yeah, you're on board. Listen, I help you get. I help you get fucking custody of the kids. You, you, you know, we'll get a good lawyer. That's what a fucking friend does. You don't. Do, so, me and I, I call you sometimes. I'm not gonna. You know, Stacy knows. I call you sometimes, and you either go. No, you usually you're good at you're good at as a friend just listening and taking it, and then when you're in a good mood and things are good with you, you go, ah, you know. Like you just leave it, you just leave it over. Yeah, and then but if you're going through something, then you just go. I want me and you always go. No, no, no. They do. Like you want to know why? And then this is when I know you really are in a mood when you go. You whisper and you go. You want to know why, Paul? And then you say my first name, and I'm like, Oh yeah, here it comes. Oh, yeah. It comes some <laughs> hey, Bill, bold. Bill never did. Never did. Oh, it's the funniest thing ever. <laughs> ever. I yeah. fucking. You know, uh, I was going through, you know, whatever. It's marriage. You're going through some shit. My wife was just fucking coming at me for like two days in a row. And I, I didn't, been, you know, I wasn't being a cunt. So I was like, what's. So in the middle of that, I called you up. I was like, dude, you know what? I go, that's just unbelievable. I go, you know what? They don't give a fuck. And Paul goes, never did. Never did. Was I burst it. I was in the grocery store when I was talking to you. Never did. It was so fucking profound to me. Because it's like the whole thing was a lie. Like, they don't give a fuck means, all right, you put a ring on them, they got a couple of kids, they're comfy. 
So now, now they can get a little fresh with you, right? Uh, but never did was that whole fucking thing is now I'm in Donnie Brasco. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, what do you mean you pull up to stop and shop and you wait for them to bring out the groceries? Do you order them online? Yeah, there's something called a Peapod pickup where basically they uh, have they have you sit um, there looking for celery and shit. No, 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 no. It's done. On a manifesto you, on the fucking order is, internet. No, your order is bagged and waiting there, like almost no, takeout. You got to order it. They don't know what you want. No, you order it. They bag it, and it's on a thing, and then you pull up. I'm they say to, no, 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 no. Fast forward. How long is it? You fucking ordering? What are you doing there? No, you no. Well, if we order whatever from the grocery store, you order. How do you they, do that? Online. Yeah. So now you yeah. got to pick it out. Yeah, but we're not picking out pro like we're not picking out peaches and shit. We do shit that they could just yeah, grab no, so off. Some the- guy's not going to eat your peach is going to pick it out. What are the odds he's not going to give you Jif when you wanted Skippy? This is your food part. They tell you that when you call. When you get there, they go, "Listen, we is it okay? We didn't have Jiffy, but there's uh, Skippy or what's the other one? Oh no, we didn't have Jif. We had Skippy. Is that okay?" And you either say yay or nay, and then they switch it for you while you wait. So you grocery shop at home, and then you drive down there, and then you sit in your car? For certain things, yes. And you only sit in your car for like two seconds. Like some diva who can't go to the grocery store anymore? No, I well, just I call mean, up. I'm I fucking go- Paul Bursey. I can't go in there. I'm going to get mobbed. No, no. I just go, hey, I'm in spot five. I'll be, you know, my trunk's open. They come out. I try tipping them. They're not Can allowed. I tell you something, Paul? I hate this new fucking world. I yeah. fucking hate it. Get out of your fucking car and go pick it. Isn't it enough somebody murdered the chicken for you? Now you got to have well, some dude. Hey, man, when my wife tells me that it's ordered already, just go pick it up. I I, I go get it. What am I going to do? I'm not fighting her. I, we go in and shop a lot, but there are certain things we go we, we need, like right now. So, you know, I, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Go down and get it? Paul, you're Italian. <laughs> Paul, Paul Versey, you're fucking Sicilian. You're going to have some fucking... Red-headed Mick like me go down and pick out your fucking produce? No, nah, it's a What's bunch the world of, coming to? It's college girls getting jobs. You know, I'm doing, you know, it's not. It's oh, not. stop playing the hero. <laughs> you don't want to get out of your Lexus. <laughs> You're listening to Journey. <laughs> Bill, I like to be comfortable. Do you even put your shoes on? I bet you're driving in slippers. She pulls up the trunks over. She's, take me, take me in your arms. <laughs> <laughs> I go to stop and shop and I'm waiting for him to bring out the groceries. <laughs> Fucking what are you a dictator? I'm just picturing you driving in with like Jersey flags on the front of your car, <laughs> flapping in like some fucking pol- I go to a I political have, rally. I got diplomatic immunity. I don't oh. have to shop for my own fucking groceries. Um dude, these fucking these kids don't, don't fucking they need toothpaste. They order it on Amazon. And it comes in like a refrigerator box. The no. thing's just bouncing. Around. Dude, I've done it a couple of times. I stopped doing it. It's stupid. The, they can't... don't have the boxes for the shit you need. They give you a giant box, and there's like a fucking thing of lotion in there. <laughs> could put a fucking air conditioner in there. Well, Bill, while, while you're in a mood, why don't you talk to us about the prevent defense that you called me about? Oh, my about. God. This is what's killing me. This, I find this fascinating, Paul, that me as a stand-up comedian who's never coached a team anywhere, ever, at any level, week after week, I just wa- I watched the Rams versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Okay? The Rams are given three points. I take the Rams because I know their defense. I know Tampa Bay's offensive line. I know the way they're playing. Okay? I like the Rams. I bet them, and when they were playing defense, they won the game. That You play to win the game. (laughs) They won the game, Paul. Let me get this right. They won the game by seven points. Okay? They had the game won if they just kept playing defense. But they went to the prevent in the first half and in the second half, and they ended up losing the game by three points. They gave up 10 points. The whole first half, okay, they're going into the half. It's 7-3. to three. They're playing defense. Tampa cannot move the fucking ball. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. 
There's like two minutes left or whatever. They go to a prevent defense against Tom Brady. Gee, what the fuck do you think he's going to do? There was like there was like seconds left. Mm-hmm. And I, I was literally watching it on my podcast live. I go, well, they just gave him a field goal. They go right down the field, yep. kicks a field goal. Paul, they had three points. Now they have six points. Now, I know you and I aren't the best with math, but you just doubled their score. You were up by four. Now mm-hmm. you're only up by one. But Paul, yeah. guess what? Guess what? You didn't let him get behind you. Yeah. That's their big takeaway. I didn't let him get behind you. You didn't fucking play defense. The whole point of defense is not to fucking get scored on. And you just gave them points. Dude, that was really bad. They go in the really second bad. half, Paul. They go in the yeah. second half. It's the same fucking story, Paul. They can't move the goddamn ball. When Tampa plays, I mean, when the Rams play defense, they gave up three fucking points. Yep. So it was it should have been 13 to 6, but instead it was 13 to 9. Brady gets the ball back. They go into the prevent defense, and in like four plays, they're right down the fucking field. You just give them 80 yards. Let's give them a 20 yard cushion and let them go out of bounds. This whole fucking fantasy that it's gonna eat up the clock before they have time, it just doesn't work. So then they go down there. Now you're giving Tom Brady four shots at the end zone, and he gets a ticky-tack pass interference call. And what was funny is the second they got into the red zone, the Rams started playing defense again, and it became difficult again. It's like, why the fuck yeah. didn't you do that down yeah. the other end of the field? Now, the prep conference comes along, and I'm sitting there. I'd tear my hair up, Paul, if I had any left. All right, I had a full head of hair before they had. The I love that you stayed defense. for the press conference. <laughs> I I'm, okay to be honest with you, I didn't even watch it, but I've never heard in a press conference yeah. anybody ever. Say, it's John Madden's quote: "Is the prevent defense prevents you from winning?" That's a Hall of Fame coach. None it's of these coaches ever won hundred games faster than him. They go in there and they go, "Yeah, you know, you didn't get it done today." Da da da, and then they just go into missed opportunities, things we need to do better. And this is what I don't understand. They go, well, these these coaches are afraid. They're afraid to lose. It's like, what do you mean they're afraid? I'm watching the fucking Packers versus the, the Lions. They go for it on fourth and goal in the first quarter. They're, they're in the middle of losing four games in a row. Just get some fucking points. They throw an interception. They come away with no points. But yeah. they get the scapegoat of analytics. So they yeah. have balls in the first quarter. And no brains. Why the fuck are you going to a prevent defense at the half? Yeah. Why don't you go into it between the first and second quarter? What is the big? What's the difference between the end of the first and se- yeah. second quarter and the end of the second quarter going into the half? Yeah. What is the difference in that, Paul? It's not the end of the yeah. game. No, no. And and here's the other thing too. That what you just said about going out of bounds. That Rams prevent on Brady's last drive, dude. <laughs> They were like so far back and letting the guy catch it and go out of bounds. But let me ask you this. I got a question about your Patriots and during their run. Did Belichick, because you obviously saw the game more games than I did. Did Belichick do a prevent during that dynasty run? He didn't a lot, right? No, everybody does it. Everybody does it and it drives me fucking bananas. But back in the day, they at least tried to keep you in the middle of the field. Is it a clock eating? I was so beside myself. When I was watching that game, with five minutes left, I knew it was going to happen. I was like, they're going to stop him here. They're going to get the ball back, and they're going to go down the field, and I'm going to die a thousand deaths watching Tom Brady get four shots at the end zone, and it's Tom Brady, and he's going to get in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I literally shut it off, and I turned on a fucking hockey game. Let me ask this, Paul. When you watch a baseball game, and your Yankees are up by two, and they go into the ninth inning, do they move the outfield to the fucking warning track to keep the ball in front of them? Or do they keep playing baseball? Yeah, it's a good point. It's a great point. Um, is it a is it a clock eating tactic? Is the prevent to eat clock? What is that? It, it's a clock eating tactic, right? I always thought it was so That's- that you don't give up the big play. And it's like if you can just keep them underneath, underneath, you keep them on the field. The clock is still going. They have to burn a timeout. Uh, you're not letting a guy get away because I think and you that, can't let a guy out of bounds, though. You listen, can't let a guy out yeah, of bounds. I understand. I understand the whole theory. It doesn't work. Right. Yeah. It no, doesn't, it doesn't work. Everybody turns into Joe Montana in the 80s and goes 
the the first yeah. 80 yards. Everybody's on the fucking 20 yard line yeah. in four to six plays or in field goal range, in scoring range, because if it's if they if they're up by like two or three, then they start playing defense at the middle of the field, and then it becomes hard again. The second they start playing, this is another thing too, Paul. The whole fucking game, they didn't get behind you, and you would think, you would think it was happening every other play. That that's what I was gonna say. It's like nobody scores any points, and then at the end of the game, all these great plays happen. Yeah. Um, well, I got I got some good news. I got some news that I wanted to tell you too. Okay, I'm actually excited about this. I couldn't say it last year because I was a third coach reserve. Right. My 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 daughter's basketball team, like I went on the list for third reserve. So I go, look, I go, I travel. I know they do weekend games. Sometimes I said, I don't want to disappoint the girls. I said, but I'll be the third guy if the first two can't do something and I'm available. So they put me on the list. But not this year, guys. This year I didn't go head coach because I still have to travel and I have a tour coming up. But uh, your boy, Paul, he's assistant coach of his daughter's uh, modified fifth and sixth grade basketball team. Okay, so that means I'm at the practices, I'm at the games, I'm on the sidelines. Oh, this is what that means, is if the head coach gets a couple of tees, you're grabbing the clipboard. <laughs> I so love I'm it. Gonna be, yeah, I'm going to be there on the sidelines. Uh, my daughter is actually, you know, luckily one of the better girls. She's not afraid. She's got a great shot. She's one of the bigger girls. So uh, she's like, Dad, can you coach me this year, please? Can you be? And I was like, I'll be on the sidelines. I'll be on the sidelines this year. So, you know, Stacy just wants to make sure that I don't say any, you know, I got to just because it, it's we're a small community. So, like, if I call an official over and say something, everybody sees and knows. So I got to I got to do it like diplomatically. <laughs> That's fucking hilarious. My wife does that to me all the time. Anytime we go into like a social event, she gives me like a fucking pregame speech. Dude, in my wife's defense, we got a coach of this girls' soccer team that all you do is hear him scream the whole game, dude, and to the point where the opposing parents are just like, they love it because the guy's so passionate, but it's like the wife is just going like, dude, what are you? He's like, I mean, they're like young girls, and he's screaming, dude. Go get back. Are you tired? Are you tired? Like, dude, it's – it's it's and it's for him. coaching. <laughs> I know, dude, but the girls, like, they're like – you know, they're in fifth grade. They get nervous, dude. Dude, if you had a guy like me or you screaming, are you tired to a fucking fifth grade girl? It's not really. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in a different time. It was probably wrong. <laughs> I told you when I played football, when I was in the third grade, I used to move my thigh pads to the side because when we did leg lifts, if your feet came down, the coach, we was walking by, he'd kick you in the side of the leg to get your legs back up. Oh, really? I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah, in front of the parents. <laughs> no dude let's be honest when we were growing up i know you're a little older than i am but like dude there were like coaches that got in trouble for making kids run till they puked and shit it's like dude it's like it's borderline fucking nuts man <laughs> oh yeah there was like kids in texas used to die every year doing two days in fucking july yeah dude that's that's fucking brutal andrew did you play any sports football basketball yeah Baseball for 15 years and then uh, basketball, you know, in there. I never played football. It's Beard Club, everybody. Having a good-looking beard requires work. I mean, look at this day. No, I like to go low. Uh, yours looks good, Bill. Um, whether it's a beard growth, whether it's beard growth <coughs> oils, uh, style products, or uh, top-of-the-line trimmer. There's a small army of products required to grow your best beard. Luckily, Beard Club is here to help. As a leader in uh, beard-first men's growth and grooming, Beard Club delivers quality hardware and consumables that will help you get a better, thicker, fuller-looking beard. Okay, I love Beard Club. They actually sent me the stuff, dude. It's got, like, vitamins and oils, perfect trimmer, uh, easy to use, nice looking set, dude. Look at this. I go a little lower, but if I want to go a little <coughs> fuller, it's it's an amazing, amazing beard kit, dude. And they left no stone unturned. You get everything. It looks good. It's shiny. You could cut it the way you want to cut it. You got to get this. You got to get this kit. Okay. Head to beardclub.com. Better. Take the beard quiz and use my code better at checkout. All you got to do is use our code BETTER. That's B-E-T-T-E-R. You don't know how to spell better. Your brain dead. Simple. Go in there. 
They'll recommend uh, the best beard kit that's tailored to fit your needs, no matter what type of beard you have. Beard Club has the perfect kit to fit your needs. Beard Club, over 2 million beards served. Grow your best beard Beard. today. Take 20% off your order when you go to beardclub.com slash better and use code better. That's beardclub.com slash better. Uh, Code better for 20% off your first order. All right. It's Helix, everybody. You know, Helix Helix. is is a premium mattress brand that provides tailored mattresses based on your unique sleep preferences. At Helix lineup, the Helix lineup includes 14 unique mattresses, including a collection of luxury models, Paul. They got they're, they're like they're gilded with fucking gold right up against your ass. A mattress for big and tall sleepers and even a mattress made just for kids. <laughs> you got a so fat girlfriend? Which, huh? <laughs> you got a fat girlfriend? Well, Helix is Helix got you. I mean a big and tall girlfriend? I mean a big and tall girlfriend. You got a gold digger? You know? They got they got a mattress that you can hide your fucking wallet in when you go to sleep in case she wakes up and tries to go through it while you're counting sheep. So how will you know which Helix mattress works best for you and your body? Well, you take the goddamn Helix sleep quiz and find your perfect mattress in under two minutes. And your personalized mattress is shipped to your door free of charge. They don't build it into the mattress price. They just send it out there for nothing. And I think Helix Plus, will give you 99 days. 99 days. Helix knows there's no better way to test out a new mattress by fucking on it and sleeping on it in your own home. That's or rub one out. Even uh, after the midterm elections, whatever which way they went, <laughs> you're still allowed to do that, Paul. Whether your dick's blue or red. Hey, hopefully it's red, okay? Right? Get it? Whether you're jerking huh? off to farmers or uh, yoga instructions. Yeah, that was this a... This Helix mattress, a... you can try it out risk-free for 100 days. Hey, it depends on who you're sleeping with, okay? Try it. Try out your new Helix mattress. <laughs> See how your body adjusts. And if you decide it's not the best fit, Fit, you're welcome to return. Dude, how many fucking mattresses would Jeffrey Dahmer be returning? <laughs> I love Helix, Paul. Plus, Helix mattress mattresses are American made and they come with a 10 to, 10 to 15 year warranty, you know, depending on your size, depending on the model. And remember, you get to try it out 100 nights risk free. Uh, what do you do for a living? I pick up Helix mattresses after 100 nights. <laughs> Oh my God! How picky do you got to be on like not nine night ninety where you're like I still don't know. Oh God! Please tell me you got the booster. <laughs> don't want to take my word for it. Helix has been awarded the number one mattress picked by GQ and Wired magazine. It's even recommended by multiple leading chiropractors, Paul, and doctors of sleep medicine as the go-to solution for improving your sleep. Helix is offering up to two hundred dollars off all mattresses, mattress orders, and two free pillows to our listeners go to helixsleep.com slash better with helix better sleep starts now and i will tell you something i had a lower back problem and we got the medium firm helix and all jokes aside dude in all seriousness it helped my back it's a it's a really good mattress rubbing out did that help too for a little isometrics well you know me and my wife my wife's been frisky lately so we've been fucking going at it and this thing holds up (laughs) no it's (laughs) (laughs) You like to fuck firm or soft? Um, all right. No, you'd be a I only played season. football. I played football right up until our first game, and my dad saw CTE come, and he goes, you got you got too many brains. I'm not going to have you fucking smashing into people. Um, it was it was actually really smart. Yeah, because, yeah. yeah, I mean, who's I – mean, I don't need to say this, but I will say it. Like, I wasn't getting a scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> My dad was probably like, all right, this kid's dumb enough. I don't need to <laughs> stop putting dents in his head. No, but I remember growing up, we used to get mad at parents that were like that. Be like, dude, he's playing football. And parents, the parents that were going like, we don't want our son to play. It's going to get hurt. I remember everyone going, what the fuck are they doing? Let him play. And it was like, now you look and you're like, no, like they they protected you. Yeah, it's uh 
I don't know. And then like, like the equipment, it's weird. It got better in the, the wrong way, especially like in hockey. Dude, when I grew up, you played hockey, dude. That was just like that foam shit. Like if you hit somebody hard enough, that still hurt you. So it wasn't like, then it just became like that Barry Bonds. You're just going out there like a suit of fucking armor. And back when those those certain style of hits, those Scott Stevens hits were legal. You know, people come down on Scott Stevens, but it's just like, that was legal. Dude, that guy would, you'd fucking follow through on a shot. <laughs> you'd come by like 25 miles an hour with his shoulder. With fucking, it's like he hit you with a wrench. These guys, like, guys as big as Lindros with, like, helicopter 180 around and just be completely unconscious. And it was, that was just called hard-nosed hockey. Like, uh, there's, there's, there's hits from back in the day you just look at, like, dude, you would go to jail now for that. Um, they just didn't understand, or they, yeah. I think they did understand. They were just, the public didn't understand what was happening, but, uh, that guy Riley Cote is doing some great work with uh, mushrooms for guys in, uh, with hockey dealing with post concussion syndromes and I stuff just, like that. Yeah, I just saw a study that said that mushrooms. Um, they said <laughs> that it's not as much the psychedelic magic mushrooms that people like, you know. But they said that there's a mushroom which is like that that they're treated for depression and it's really helping people all right and big pharmaceuticals going to get freaked out and then they're going to own all of it and then they're going to get the seeds and they're going to turn it in they're going to put sugar in it and they're going to fuck the whole thing up that's what's going to happen like yeah. they did with weed i don't know much about weed but i can tell you like i never smoked it back in the day i didn't try it till later on in life but every guy i know that used to smoke is like they, like so many of them like dude i don't fuck with that shit because like, that that isn't weed anymore yeah. Like, dude, you can be like borderline tripping off of some of this shit. It's too much, dude. You would think if it got legal, it would get healthier. But it's healthier in that, you know, maybe there's not as many rat turds in it, you know, or whatever. And fucking. I just don't understand ant, why antennas, some of somebody... But like the, the, yeah. the shit that as far as like processed foods and, and like how like. Like the steaks and shit, they're feeding cows to other cows. If you know, man made salmon, that was my shit because I figured, you know, if it's out in the ocean, it's going to be fucking, you know, eat my old rollerblades as they decompose and I'm going to be eating them, right? They say that, you know, that they're swimming in like maggots and all of this stuff. Like, I just don't understand. Like, at some point, Paul, with another midterm election going by, and yet again, the country is blaming a blue tie this time. Last time they blamed, blamed the red tie. We're still in the same situation. It's these fucking banks. It's the Ponzi scheme. It's that everybody has to be a slave to the dollar that you you would literally do that to animals that you're then going to feed to people and kids yeah. because you're so trying to get ahead of the game that they've created. What kills me is they're a bunch of suits. It's not like they're gangsters. They're like pencil and paper gangsters. It's really yeah. fucking depressing. And watching everybody once again, just watching the herd, every midterm election, ah, ah, doing this. And I also, I don't even buy it. Like, does no. it make any sense to you, Paul, that Trump got elected in 2016, right? And then where did all these extra fucking people that didn't want him show up in 2020? And where did all those people that voted for him go? Yeah, I know. Am I really to believe that somebody switched political parties? Because they don't. It's all bullshit. It is. And like it's the midterm elections, it's just like, because Paul, if, if I didn't, I know I don't pay attention to this shit, but I'm assuming it went all red, right? No, it Most, didn't. No, it didn't. Free split. It, no, it didn't. It was actually a lot closer than it was a lot closer than they thought. As a matter of fact, it's kind of looked at as a win for the Democrats because well, it did all my theories. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't go. <laughs> it didn't shift. It actually they thought it was gonna, and like you know, it didn't. But I know what you're saying though. There is a truth to like where's everybody from the, now. People people either come out of the woodworks or don't. Um, I kind of got into it late. There was a guy out here, Paul, that was running for mayor. Yeah. Against this the, the woman. Okay. She spent nine million. This guy spent a hundred million dollars of his own money. 
to get how an much? office that I guarantee you pays like a hundred grand a year. Wait, how much did he spend? He spent a hundred million dollars of his own money. Oh my God. And I'm trying to buy the story of like what? Uh, he wasn't in my district, so I can't even. I couldn't vote one way or the other. But I was just looking at that thing. And I'm like, nobody loves the city that much that they're gonna burn a hundred million of their own money. It's like you're getting in there. Yep. To fucking grease whatever the fuck it is you're doing. And this guy's like in real estate. So I'm like, that's it's perfect. gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see if that guy uh dude, that's perfect. That's the best way to look at it. Nobody cares that a hundred million of your own I'm money. I'm gonna spend a hundred million dollars to make a hundred grand a year. To be a mayor because fuck I really want to clean up these streets. Get the fuck out of here. Sell me another one. Dude, um, Back to the topic and you I'm were talking. I'm only saying that now because the election already happened. Because I'm not going to be that fucking asshole that thinks he knows what's going on and tells people how to vote. Because I'm not. I right. just last night learned that. But like I said, I'm not. In, I'm not in L.A. County district, so I, I don't fucking vote. Yeah, yeah, that. no, no, no. Um, going back to what you said <laughs> about weed and being stronger, dude. We were out when we were doing the All In tour. Me, Lawhead, and Bartnick. We were out west. I want to say it was. It was Portland or Seattle. I think it was Portland. A guy goes, yo, dude, Snoop Dogg gets the weed. <laughs> yo, this is Snoop Dogg gets the weed from this guy. So the guy comes out there. He gives Bartnick and I the weed. Dude, I swear. And you know me. I'm not a big weed smoker, dude. I took one hit of this thing. And for 45 minutes, I was on another planet. Bartnick smoked the whole thing with the guy. And he's walking. Did you start hearing Snoop Dogg music? Dude, dude. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> dude, Sipping Bartnick was walking. <laughs> He was like sideways, like fucking Frankenstein. He's drinking, dude. I mean, Bartnick was, I don't know how he fucking held it together, but he's Bartnick, dude. It was something that I'm like, that's not recreational, man. That's not, that is not whatever. It's not I, weed. No, dude. It's like, it's like the moonshine version of weed. Where do you weren't there, dude? I remember one time we went to uh, a game, Clemson. Oh, I um, missed that. I keep hearing about the lake house. Yes, we have to. We stand on this lake, and this guy next door to us, you know, southern guy or whatever, he kind of came out and he was looking at us. He could tell we weren't from there, renting the house. <coughs> so he said, "He was like, we said, hey, how's it going?" He's like, "How y'all doing?" I was like, "You know, just a bunch of Yankees over here making noise on this pier, and you know, sort of shit on us." And then he fucking relaxed. We talked a little bit, dude. This guy knew, he knew all the great moonshiners. Of that state, the way I know 70s NFL players. And he started saying, you know, I got some jars of it. You guys want to come over, whatever. Long story short, the night comes around, he comes out, and Bartnick and those guys went over there. Thank God I wasn't drinking. Because I've never seen, you know, Bartnick, nothing. No. Nothing stuns Bartnick, dude. Each one of them, one by one, about five-minute intervals. Because I went back into the house, and they went over to this guy's house. One by one. They all hey, came in with like this 600 yard stare. <laughs> just going, yeah, I do. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to bed. Uh, I'm going to bed. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I wasn't there because I would have been oh, one yeah. of them. I think Willis walked by, didn't say a fucking word. Bartnick just came in and was just like, yeah, dude, I think I'm all set. It's like, when Bartnick's always like, I feel great. For Bartnick to say he's all set, dude, he was feeling something for sure. <laughs> Apology to the fans. I'm fucking sick. If you haven't noticed. Oh, dude. What anything is anything funnier than the friend who gets fucked up and there's no talking? They just disappear. They just, <laughs> dude. The beeline to the bedroom is one of my favorites because they're just like, I'll see you in the morning. And it's, dude, it's, I would be at a bar and I would just so want to go home, and my friends were still going, and I didn't realize it was because a couple of them, you know, were riding the rail there. I fucking. Uh, I, I just a few times I just did the Irish goodbye and walked home. Like how I didn't get hit by a car. And I was gonna say that's dangerous, dude. Dude, I did it along a highway one time and I was staying on the inside of the guardrail. And I was coming, you know, the lights and it looked kind of dark. I didn't know what it was. The lights were in my face. And I took a step and I was just falling. Jesus. <laughs> You ever see that race those people have where they run down that hill somewhere in Europe and they're just <laughs> falling down the hill? I was doing that in the pitch black. Oh, my God, it dude. It fucking landed in gravel, and I realized it was train tracks. No. 
that were going underneath. Dude, I'm like, I didn't break my neck. Oh, my God. I was just so fucking hammered. I was like fucking rubber. You know, I just. (laughs) Dude, that reminded me of something that got me actually really upset just now, because I remember my first manager, Tony Camacho. Okay, he was a big Giants fan, is a big Giants fan. He's out there in Vegas now. He's getting old or whatever. He was my first manager, and I wanted to work with him because I found out he worked with Jim Brewer. I found out, like, Martin Lawrence used to knock on his door and try working with him. And I was like, oh, this guy, like, thought I was funny, right? And he, w- I got tickets to Giants, and he was my first manager. You know me. I'm a fucking – you're good to me once. I'll fucking – Right. So I get tickets to Giants-Cowboys – and I got to go find the bookie to get it. And they go, yeah, he's over there. And I didn't realize I could have crossed a bridge or went through a path. And I was so fucking anxious to get him. Dude, I crossed the New Jersey turnpike, eight lanes, this way and that way, like Frogger, to get it, dude. And I Like Eddie been... Murphy and Bowfinger. Dude, it was like Eddie Murphy and <laughs> Bowfinger, dude. I could have been killed and I just wanted to do it. And then I saw what I could have done. And I just thought of my mother and like my wife being like, what the, f-? dude, it, I could have been killed. Dude, dude, if I fell down there and I got knocked out, no one would have found me. I probably would have died of hypothermia or a brain bleed or something. Oh, from, dude, that's all right. What do you think? I was just trying to think. What do you think the greatest coaching press conference in history was? In your lifetime. I was your just lifetime. telling somebody that I became a better comedian. Uh or at least handling people asking me questions. And I think it's because I used to watch Bill Parcells press conferences. And what I loved about him is if you asked a good question, he would answer it. But if you asked a dumb question, he would tell you that that was a stupid question. And he was the only coach that I saw that really had, they were on their heels. He wasn't going in there looking at them like, oh God, what are they going to ask me? He was yeah. looking at them like, don't don't waste my time. Don't ask me something fucking stupid. And I wish more people would do that because we would get better interviews. And, um, and like, do you mind, I got to tell you something. Do you mind of times I watch people in the public eye answer a fucking question? It's like, why would you even answer that? Or why would you just yeah. say this? Like, hey, so-and-so did blah, 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 blah. What do you think about that? I don't know. What do you think about it? Yeah. Let's put your fucking career on the hot plate. What, what is, the fuck are you doing here? Let me ask you. What you're doing is such a piece of shit move because you don't give a fuck about that. You're using that to try to get me in trouble. You're a fucking piece of shit. Yep. You say that without the fucks and the anger. I think it helps you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, dude, they, they don't know, man. Like I went on the radio to do press and I just kept going. I got to ask you. So what do you think about like them charging $8 to get the blue check on Twitter now? And like, and I, at first I was like, all right, that's one question. And then like every radio station I did, all right, before we let you go, like, so this Elon Musk thing, dude, they just have like stock questions that are just like, it's just so bad. It's so easy. There's no, nothing- anybody can just pay $8 to get a blue check. No. So, so Elon Musk was basically saying, if you got a blue check on Twitter, you should just pay the people that have it should pay should pay to make, to keep it like 20 bucks a year or whatever. And then Stephen King, the author who hates Elon Musk goes like, really, you're going to charge and like went at him. And then Elon sarcastically goes, well, how about we do eight? How about we do eight bucks? Like he, he said, like, it's the, and then like, and then he kept it at eight. eight so then like every month. radio station, what's that Andrew? Eight bucks. It's eight bucks a month. Oh, eight bucks a month to keep it. And like, everyone just asked the same question. Like, what do you think? It's like, is that like what this, like, you're, is that what we're wasting time on? The, the, that's why they're audience they think, members. They want to charge me eight dollars a month. I don't give a shit. I don't. That's, I'm using Twitter for free. Why should I use it for free? I don't care about that. I said the exact same thing. I go, dude. If it's eight bucks, it's eight bucks. Like I don't like. That's a dumb question, though. Yeah, it's just like how fucking what kind of world? If you have a fucking blue check, I think you can afford eight bucks, right? <laughs> yeah. If it's some yeah. comic on his way up. You know, or some influencer just starting out. Yeah, cut them a break. But once they get a certain amount, you know, we all got to yeah. throw our whore money back into the till every once in a while to keep the machine what, going. 
Well, you know what I don't what I find stupid is all these celebrities and all these people that are like, hey, should we come together and leave Twitter because Elon come Musk together? And it's like leave Twitter because you don't like Elon Musk or what he's about. Do you know how many companies you buy things from that if you knew what the CEOs and owners fucking were that you would fuck? So are you gonna find yeah, out what they what, do to animals, what they do yeah, to the plants, ex- what they exactly. do making your clothes? Yeah. Yeah, you're going to find out everything. Listen, if you found out everything about the top people at the products that you buy, what are you going to just fucking sit home and something as a liberal? I'm sick of liberals trying to fucking gang people up against somebody because they don't like their political views. You're not fucking liberal if you're doing that. Leave people alone. He has the right to think what the fuck he wants. And if he wants Donald Trump's ass and balls on that fucking site, I don't give a shit. I don't care. I'm not a fan of Donald Trump. If we want to back on there, I don't give a fuck. It doesn't change anything. Yeah. It doesn't change anything. You know, there's no fucking tweet, you know, that anybody can, like, that would be like, well, Joe Biden's on there, and then he's going to convince people that wanted to vote for Trump all of a sudden and be like, well, I can't read Donald Trump tweets. Now I'm going to root for Joe Biden. It's not, everybody's already made their mind up. Dude, if the guy that invented white leather in cars was fucking punting puppies off of a fucking, I'm still getting a white leather car. He didn't invent it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I, First I don't. Of all, that it, company's not even making money. It's subsidized by the government. But I'm fine with it because <laughs> anything that gets us out of the Middle East, you know. I mean, oh, you fucking need the goddamn oil to make the batteries. It's like, whatever. It's still going to hurt them. Still going to hurt them a little bit, right? From a guy who just bought an F-250. I'm uh, so yeah. cool shit, Paul. I can't even get through an idea anymore <laughs> before this thing in my brain goes, what are you talking about, Bill? You just did this. <laughs> Oh, I can't wait for that truck to come, Paul. Dude, what are you going to do? I just want to know, what are you going to do? A guy, I don't know if you could do it. It, dude because you got that thing like my what are you going to do when you retire are you do you have it in you to sit and do nothing for a while oh you don't even understand <laughs> you don't even understand paul how quickly i can shut it off it's just like cigars <laughs> it's just like cigars you did shut off alcohol too i gotta give I've you gone that. 10 days without cigars i don't need to ever smoke another one again i'm just done are I'm you done sa- i'm not saying i'm done but uh. if i wanted to be i could i can just walk away from shit and, like, I had never thought I could walk away from stand-up. Dude, six weeks into the pandemic, I wasn't even thinking about comedy anymore. It's like I never did it. Oh, dude. Like De Niro in Heat, Paul. You just, you just walk away. Dude, 55-60. 55-60. No one's seeing me again. Well, you, a couple other people. Yeah, uh, Paul, that number keeps dropping. 55-60? Six, dude, 55. 60. 60 is the number, dude. I'm not getting on an airplane at 60, dude, to fucking leave my family, dude. Fuck that. Well, your family's going to be out of the house, Paul. Hey, hopefully, you know what, though? That the Rodney Dangerfield blueprint is a nice one. You get enough money, you open a comedy club in the local thing, you show up when you want, you hey, how's everybody doing? Thanks for coming, okay? We got a great lineup. <laughs> you know, you, dude, that's what he said in his book. He goes, I didn't want to leave my family anymore. I was established. So I just decided to open a place I could go on stage anytime I want to work on stuff. I was with my family every night. And I'm like, yeah, dude, it was actually sad. I drove past the site for the first time and seeing no danger fields on 61st Street. And it just said property for rent and it's all empty. But the weird thing was it was kind of bizarre. They still had old black and white headshots of like J.J. Ramirez, uh, uh, Quincy, oh, no, what, what's his name? Uh, you know the kid. Quentin, Quentin Heggs, J.J. Ramirez. I think there's one of either Norm McDonald, rest his soul, or another guy. Oh, and Nancy then the, Redmond. Steve Marshall, like this is up. And they got Nancy all Redmond. The, maybe, yeah. And, and then it's just empty. And then it says property for rent with all these stickers. And, dude, I lived on 62nd. And th- dude, I saw you. I told you this story. It was it's one of the most unbelievable things about our friendship is Stacy went to a bachelorette party, some friend, dude. I'm 22 years old, 23 years old. I lived on 62nd and 3rd with my brother Christian, and it's snowing, and I had nothing to do. And I got into comedy, but I was in no rooms. And I go, I'm gonna go to Dangerfields alone. And I went into Dangerfields, 
and I'm sitting there by myself. It's like a blizzard. There's like 40, 50 people in there. You're probably 37, 38 years old at the time. You're on stage doing your thing. I remember the bit you did about your... I met you before then. I was younger than that. I met you when I was 37. Okay, so you were younger than that. You were probably 34, 35. And you're up there. You did the joke about... I remember it was a danger field. It was a dingy room. Tell me the joke. I could probably tell you the year. The joke was, uh, yeah, my my, uh, wife wants to go to brunch. Let's pay $18 for eggs. Oh no, no. That was then that was right before I met you. I wrote that, that in like that was like oh four, oh five. As a matter of fact, and I it would have been you, girlfriend. Girlfriend. I, I think you said you were thirty six or something, and you looked over at me. I'm by myself just watching comedy. You go, This guy is you go you guys never forget it. You go, This guy just by himself watching comedy. This guy's cool, or that's cool. And I remember I was like, Oh, he didn't I pick up. I talked to you. You talked to me from the stage, dude, when I didn't know you. How wild is that? You go, this guy's here by himself. He goes, oh, that's, that's cool, so man. That's so fucked up because Pete Davidson, I met him. I did a, I did a gig in Atlantic City, and his mother came up to me. He said, oh, it's my son. He wants to use all fucking. It was something about Pete. I never forgot him. I said, all right, you want to do Steve already Because he was like 14 or something. I can't remember if he had just started doing it. I said, all right, man, you know, you, do, you started young, <clears throat> really young. That's great. Good luck to you and blah, 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 and all that shit. And, um, then years later, he's like, I don't know if you remember. I was like, yeah, I remember you. Because he looked the same. If you look at Pete when he's a little kid. Yeah, he looks he, the same. He's one of those guys. He looks the same. You know who else was on that show? You at Dangerfield? Was, uh, who else was that with you at Dangerfield? Yeah, I know. And he he, he has this, like, innocence about um, Mike Britt. And Mike Britt was on oh. Danger. Mike Britt was on Dangerfield. And I think he said something to me, like, where's your girl? You're alone. And I go, yeah, she's at a bachelorette party. So he's like, oh, she's got dicks all. I think he said something like that. And I, everyone's laughing. But I remember now when I'm on stage and somebody's alone, I, I always kind of want to be nice. Or sometimes I'll, if it's weird, but, and I was like, cause you were nice. Cause you know, and you were like, oh, this guy's by himself. Cool dude. And I remember like nobody was eating a dick. But I remember you guys up there in Dangerfields is longer sets. So you guys are doing like They're 20 half hour sets. Yeah. yeah, half hour sets. And you guys were up there and, it, you know, it was it was a blizzard. There wasn't many people and just standing in the pocket working shit out. You were 36. I'm pretty sure it's fucking nuts, dude. Well, I remember uh, what I loved about that gig is if you went up there and you caught a zone, even there was like three, four people there but a lot of times there was during that time. Um. You just learned how to stay in a zone and riff and not give a fuck. And you kind of like became like, uh, like bullet. You learned how to freestyle and improvise and shit. Like you weren't going to sit there doing, doing your act. And I remember uh, all the guys used to give a shit. Norton was the guy that first went over there. And what he said made sense. He goes, dude, it's great. You know, you, you get to, you get to do a half hour of your 45 minutes. So, you know, you're not rusty on the weekends. Like I think Paul, they, you don't even understand how many guys in New York in the nineties, like their whole thing was, I'm not doing the road until I'm famous. And I was just sitting there going like, so okay, stupid. So, so stupid because it was like, do you want, okay, you're playing blackjack. Do you want to be splitting aces? Or you just want to play that? You know, it's like, a lot of that's just, fear. I think a lot of that's fear, dude. Because I know, I think guys were afraid to get out there, man. It's also like laziness. I remember hearing a guy one time said to me, like, yeah, you know, I I, I like being home. I like being home. And I was sitting there going, like, I was so fucking mad at him. Who doesn't? Exactly. It's like, we're out here fucking making sacrifices and shit. Like, that, that's the whole thing about this. Don't fucking say you like being home. I love being home. Dude, I can't tell you how many times I fucked, especially when I was playing, like, uh, this strip. On a Friday or Saturday night, and I had nothing going on in my career, and I was walking down the street in this in that perfect New York right before it gets ungodly hot in July and August, and I'd see all these beautiful people out on dates, all these fucking Wall Street guys, and all these people with fucking money that lived in doorman buildings, and they'd be sitting out eating these fucking good-looking guys with these beautiful girls out on a date, and I would be thinking, like, I'd love to be sitting there with that beautiful woman having a date right now, blah, blah, blah. But I got, and I was just like, 
And then you start thinking, like, did I do the wrong fucking thing? Like, what? I got out of that. Why did I do that? And then you'd walk into the strip. And you go in and you go on stage and you fucking kill. You'd fucking kill. And then I remember, like, you'd be walking out of there going by the same restaurant. And be like, I'm going to get the girl. I just got to fucking keep doing this. That'll happen when it's supposed to happen. But, like, uh, that's like when that guy said that. I like being home, you know? Uh, I just want to be, like... I, 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 don't know how to, I don't even know how to, like, I mean, I just sort of walked away when the guy said, I was like, yeah, all right. Okay. Well, enjoy being home. <laughs> Is that guy doesn't make any sense to me. That's like being a firefighter. Like, why would you be a comedian if you like being home? That's like being a firefighter and you're afraid of fire. Well, I was going to say, what about being a professional athlete? <laughs> yeah. We got a game in Minnesota. I like being home. Like, yeah. I, I like the home games. Remember how Roger Clemens the last year in his career, if he wasn't starting on the road trip, he didn't have to go. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. No, nah, man. I remember Jim Norton said danger fields is where jokes go to die. I will say this. I turned danger fields into a positive and I was able to figure out how to kill in that room. But there were times where your a shit in that room would get like a, ah, and you'd be like, Oh boy. <laughs> like, All right. Oh yeah. No, it, you know, it gave you like, yeah, it would give you a, a sense of the road and and the ignorant road. They could get some really dumb crowds in there, and uh, but it was still was good for you. I used to have a running bit going with uh, you know that that waiter that that was there for every passed away Chario. Remember him? Rest his soul. Yeah, yeah. He, he always reminded me of uh, Mark Marquez in um, in uh, no Mark Margolis. Mark Marquez, talking mo fucking Moto GP rider. Mark Margolis. Uh, from Scarface, Breaking Bad. Oh yeah, he, yeah, yes, yeah. He looked just like him. Yeah, and I think he, I think he was Mark Margolis, obviously Greek guy. I think this Chario was Greek, and I used to fuck with him. I used to sing his name when he would walk by, and he would turn. I go Chario, Chario. And I would, I would make this big grin, and I would look at him, and I'd point at him. They turn around and look at me. I go, what's your name? I like saying your name, Chario. And he would just stare at me. I go, you don't have anything to say? He would always pause. And then he would give me the finger and it would get a huge laugh. And he would walk out of the showroom and his face would be lit up. Like he lived for that. He loves and, coming in. He'd go on stage too. Yeah. And he would come up later and be like, oh, you see, I waited longer that time. I waited longer. That was a, we should do that again and blah, blah. And, he, and I, I, I fucking love doing that with him. It was like, it kind of was like that a thing that I did to, to uh, on those bad nights, like on those bad nights, I would just sit there shooting the shit with him. Like Charlie, what happened to us? I know how I ended up here. I know the <laughs> hole that I had in my soul. What happened to you or whatever? Like, um, it was a. Uh, he was moody, but he would treat you good. If you were funny, he would treat you better. And then he was moody too. Like he'd be in a mood sometimes. And then at the end, he'd always be in a good mood when they put him up. They go, guys, our waiter here, he'd like to come up and he would just tell the, a couple of street jokes. And some of them would be like, you know, edgy or racy. And then he would get off and he would just be so happy that he did it, you know? Yeah. Some of those guys up at the bar that worked there were fucking weirdos, man. Oh, were, dude. Yeah, they were yeah. dark. Those guys were fucking weirdos. But you got in the showroom, they're all right. The waiters were cool. But everybody was fucking, I remember there was a fucking waiter in there. And he also ran a re website. He sold X-rated like sex toys and shit. I mean, it was just fucking. I remember one bartender was like, yeah, my fucking, fucking balls were. He was like talking about his dick and his. And I just remember being like, yeah, dude, give me a Diet Coke. But fucking. Yeah, I, I know that guy. That guy was, yeah, TMI, big time. What about yeah. downstairs in the green room? That green fucking push button phone with all the different lines. Dude, oh, yeah. like yeah. Johnny Carson used that phone. Tony, Tony used to tell me about that. Said all Tony, yeah, Tony told me a story one night. I never got in the room because every time I auditioned, he wasn't there. And finally, I was on a produced show there. And I murdered. And he sat right there and he walked right up to me. He goes, you need to be in this room. It was actually the coolest way to get in there. And then at night when he was there, we would talk. And I actually wanted to do a 50th anniversary there and whatever. People got involved, whatever. But I remember he said that. It was Johnny Carson's last stop of the night. Johnny Carson would walk and he would stop in there to have a drink. 
And he said, if Johnny, whether Johnny got like hit, hit up hard or whatever, no matter what happened, he's like, if Johnny and, and Rodney would like get drunk together or like get into an argument or whatever, he said, and then all of a sudden we go to the Tonight Show and Rodney would do it. And Johnny would just be like, nothing happened. Hey, guy there. Like, you know, but uh, that was Johnny Carson's last stop going home at night was walking into Dangerfield's bar and having a drink with those guys. Yeah, dude. when they did the Tonight Show out there. Yeah, he was telling me stories some nights when he just wanted to walk home. He was in a good mood. He was drunk. Like Johnny, too famous. He told me a story of them they were backing the limo like down First Avenue, asking him to get in the car. He's like, "Nah, I'm fine." I'm so <laughs> That's insane. He's like, "Hey, Johnny Carson." Like, "How you doing? How you doing?" Fucking hammered like some Ron Burgundy shit. Oh, it was my amazing. God. That's like something you could just do, and there was no cameras, no nothing. And the next day, he's like, "You know, I can fucking believe this shit." I'm walking up First Avenue last night. Johnny fucking Carson's coming down the street. His limo's backing up. He's not going to get the fuck out of here. I swear to God. Did you get his autograph? No. I, I, I'm it was all hearsay. It yeah, it was all hearsay. Like, yeah. I heard I heard Eddie Murphy was like, dude, like, like with no phones, he would go to a club here and there. I mean, he was always a he's a private guy, but like with no phones, he would do shit. But dude, Eddie Murphy, like, what's his name? I heard Eminem said he can't. Dude, Eminem had to be in a private room at his daughter's graduation inside, looking like out a window or some shit. Like he, he, yeah, he was away just because, dude, phones are like. And then if you catch somebody where you go, hey man, I'm just here for my daughter, leave me alone. They'll put it on and try to egg you on to be a dick. And then they and then they put it on. It's fucking horrible. Yeah. Well, I mean, I also don't know that you can get famous like those guys anymore. No, you can't. Like the level of fame that Eminem had versus the level of fame that you can have as like a like a comedian, you know, it's it's just a different thing. It's a different thing. I said this is the only time in show business history where you could sell out Madison Square Garden for a week. And the majority of people don't know who the fuck you are. But back in the day when Dice did it, everybody fucking knew. No, but there he everybody knew because he was a comedian and it was an anomaly. But nowadays, but there was always, dude, there's there's always been bands, you know, that could sell out places like <clears throat> like nobody knew who the fuck fish was. Yeah. I never heard of those fucking guys. And I remember uh, I went to something and they were headlining. I was in Boston Garden. The fucking place was going crazy. I'm like, who the fuck are these guys? And they sold out Boston Garden. This, it's always, dude. That's it's always cool. been like me shit, but now it's because there's so much shit. Like everybody's sort of, like you can literally have the number one movie in the country, and I don't think anybody, like a lot of people, wouldn't even know who you are. No, no, that Tom Cruise shit is over. Like the Tom Cruise, like that shit of like the guy having the movie. Like now, yeah, like you said, dude. Now you got. I think Hulu. that's a good thing. Because I, yeah, it's cool. personally speaking, I, I wouldn't want that ever. No, because, dude, you could star in a show on Hulu. I could star in a show on Peacock. Andrew could star in a show on HBO Max. And all of a sudden we go like, who's what? <laughs> that's the guy. That's the guy from this. That's good. You know, yeah. like it's it's uh, it's a different time. But yeah, um, you'll run into people. Being, oh, I got a TV show. Oh, you got a TV show. Yeah, we're in the fifth season. Yeah. yeah oh, dude, I remember someone was on TV. You knew. Even when I came up and there was like 80 channels, you still fucking knew. Dude, I remember the old stands. A comic comes in and they go, oh, he's on his fourth season on NBC. And dude, four people knew him. Like he was on a sitcom on NBC. And, <laughs> and they were like in his fourth season of so-and-so. And like four people. And it was just like, yeah, man, it's. it's yeah, that's back when if you had like three, four million viewers, you were hanging under the skin of your teeth like you were going to get canceled. Now four million is an over the top hit. Yeah, I don't know, man. It's uh, that's why you just got to do what you love. Be happy with it. <laughs> no, I think it's a good thing. I yeah. think it's a good thing. Um, all right, everybody. Well, this was uh, we had a good we had a good time. I had a good time. Um, this has been episode seventy one. I had a good time too, Paul. I don't know why you felt like you didn't want to include me. That just made me feel lonely. No, I said we. Um, well, you feel said better. we had a good time. I I had a good time. <laughs> it's such a fuck. Um, Andrew, I mean, all right. I got a little heated with the fucking prevent defense. You know, I like winning people money. Okay, and when I say the fucking Rams are going to cover, and they do cover, but because you fucking win, I'm going to get going again. I mean, he literally prevent defense himself into fucking a loss. 
This is this is the defending Super Bowl champions. I'm supposed to look at this guy. This guy is a Super Bowl fucking ring. Yeah. You can't do a prevent deep like it's like if you're dating a girl and you go hard. <laughs> this is probably gonna be a bad analogy. If you go hard, you're like, oh man, you're beautiful. You take her to dinner, everything's good. She's like, oh, this is amazing. This guy's so nice, he's calm. And then all of a sudden, when she starts to like you, you can't back. At the end of the night, you start blowing her off. Yeah, what'd you say? What's going on? <laughs> you're looking at your phone. She's like, what? She tells her girlfriend, something happened, dude. In the last Yeah, you're not hour. coming away with a victory, Paul. <laughs> You got to close the deal to get laid. There you go. Yeah. That's, how we'll, that's how we'll button this up. There we up. go. All right, um, everybody. Thanks for listening to Anything Better. Yep. Apologize and, for being a little sick. And anything, Andrew, we don't have any announcements, right? Uh, no. Till this next week. This is my uh, concussion tent behind me for when I blow my nose, if you're wondering. We'll see you next week on 72, everybody. Have a good one. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. I'll be at, I'll be at the stress Oh, Oh, Polly. My birthday's Friday. I'm going to be at the Stress Factory, beautiful New Brunswick, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And I got a big fucking 2023 tour coming up, February 2nd and 3rd. I'm at Gotham. I got Chicago coming up. I got I got Rhode Island coming up. I got Toronto coming up. I have Denver coming up. I have Tampa coming up. I have Utah coming up. I have Austin coming up. It's all going to be on paulverzi.com. I'm going to announce the tour soon. So check out paulverzi.com for that. The Verzi Effect, the YouTube, the, the Monday Morning Podcast, the Thursday Fucker Podcast, anything Andrew Demless has got, the GreekFreak.com, Beverly Hills Kids. Shout out to the Mazzilli Brothers at Gotham. Shout out to the Mazzilli Brothers at Gotham. Well, my I'll be there. wife calls them the Machete Brothers. <laughs> That's fucking funny. All right, everybody. We'll see you next week. <laughs>